Namaste. So this is the exciting conclusion of our series on Svapna and Sushupti Consciousness. After this, we're going to go back to Mandukya Upanishad and pick up where we left off. But the reason for this whole series was that people don't know much about sleep and dreams, huh? even though they're such an important part of our lives. We are taught through cultural programming and linguistic conditioning to ignore them and think them less important than waking consciousness. But actually, in terms of shaping our being and our whole experience of our existence, dreaming and deep sleep are much more important than waking consciousness. The main influence that waking consciousness has is the creation of karma, which is not a factor or the creation of karma is not a factor in dreams and deep sleep. In dreams, we do experience some influence from previous karma, but in deep sleep, there is no operation of karma whatsoever. So anyway, let's look at the last two verses of this program and see what they have to teach us about the multiplication of bliss. Verse 32. It becomes transparent like water, one, the witness, and without a second. This is the world, the state of Brahman, O Emperor. Thus did Yajnavalkya instruct Janaka. This is its supreme attainment. This is its supreme glory. This is its highest world. This is its supreme bliss. On a particle of this very bliss, other beings live. Shankaracharya's Commentary When, however, that ignorance which presents things other than the self is at rest, in that state of profound sleep, there being nothing separated from the self by ignorance, what should one see, smell, or know, and through what? Therefore, being fully embraced by his own self-luminous supreme self, the jiva becomes infinite, perfectly serene, with all his objects of desire attained, and the self the only object of his desire transparent like water, one, because there is no second. It is ignorance which separates a second entity, and that is at rest in the state of profound sleep, hence one. The witness, because the vision that is identical with the light of the self is never lost, and without a second, for there is no second entity different from the self to be seen. This is immortal and fearless. This is the world of Brahman, the world that is Brahman. In profound sleep, the self, bereft of its limiting adjuncts, the body and organs, remains in its own supreme light of the Atman, free from all relations, O Emperor. Thus did Yajnavalkya instruct Janaka. This is spoken by the Shruti. So this is a very dense paragraph that expresses or uh, summarizes really all the qualities of the self in Sushupti, which have been expressed in several previous verses. So this is extraordinary. Far from being unimportant or, you know, just sleep, <laughs> Sushupti is actually vital, necessary, and indispensable for our existence. Why? Because it connects us with our real self, Brahman. For a few hours every night while we're asleep, we enter the state of oneness, being the witness. And although there isn't anything else to witness, no other object, no second, no duality. 
This is also the non-dual state, the native state of the being. This is extremely important. And as I've mentioned several times, without deep sleep, we cannot live. Just try to go a few nights without sleep and see what happens. People start hallucinating. It's like they're on some kind of drugs. And ultimately, if they continue, they lose their health and their sanity even. So dreams and deep sleep are absolutely necessary for human life. And this is because in that state, we realize our true nature. So don't let anybody kid you. It's not that sleep in general and dreams and deep sleep in particular are useless or less than waking consciousness. No, they're actually more important because as it was discussed earlier, when one enters Sushupti, one brings with him the impressions from the previous day's experience plus the dreams that he has had. And then these form a creative impulse that is realized through the power of Sushupti. Because in Sushupti, one is Brahman. And Brahman is the creator of everything. Not a busy creator, not a doer, not an actor, not an agent. But simply by desiring or simply by looking over these desires or these impressions that are brought into Sushupti, they tend to happen. This is something every creative person actually knows. That if you sleep on something, huh, there's even a popular saying, I'm going to sleep on it. I'm not going to make up my mind now. Because when you wake up in the morning, you have had the experience of dreams and deep sleep to process whatever is on your mind, whatever is uh, the issue, uh, and to connect it with innumerable previous impressions that reside latently in the mind. So I could go on and on and on with this. <laughs> I mean, really, there's so much there. In psychology, this is known as the shadow. And it's known that the shadow has a deep and pervasive influence on serendipity and uh, synchronicity, what we might call luck, uh, but it's not really luck. It is the creative activity of Brahman brought about by bringing the impressions of waking and dreaming consciousness into Sushupti. Even though they are not perceived there, they are there because they are attached to the being. And this gives rise to cycles of creation in which the will of the self is expressed in the daily life. So whether you want to acknowledge it or not, the shadow, the so-called unconscious, <laughs> subconscious, or collective unconscious, whatever you want to call it, that which is not the waking consciousness, but deeper, that state wields tremendous influence over our lives. So therefore, we should begin to cultivate it consciously and use it deliberately to solve our problems and elevate our being to a higher state. Then Shankaracharya continues. How did he instruct him? This is its supreme attainment, the attainment of the individual self. The other attainments characterized by the taking of a body. From the state of Hiranyagarbha down to that of a clump of grass are created by ignorance and therefore inferior to this, being within the sphere of ignorance. But this identification with all in which one sees nothing else, hears nothing else, knows nothing else, 
is the highest of all attainments, such as identity with the gods, that are achieved through meditation and rites. This, too, is its supreme glory, the highest of all its splendors, being natural to it. Other glories are artificial. Likewise, this is its highest world. The other worlds, which are a result of its past work, are inferior to it. This, however, is not attainable by any action, being natural. Hence, this is its highest world. Similarly, this is its supreme bliss in comparison with the other joys that are due to contact of the organs with their objects, since it is eternal. For another Shruti says, that which is infinite is bliss. Chandogya 723.1 That in which one sees something, knows something, etc., is puny, mortal, secondary joy. But this is the opposite of that, hence this is its supreme bliss. On a particle of this very bliss, put forward by ignorance and perceived only during the contact of the organs with their objects, other beings live. Who are they? Those who have been separated from that bliss by ignorance and are considered different from Brahman. Being thus different, they subsist on a fraction of that bliss which is perceived through the contact of the organs with their objects. So the infinite is the real bliss. And in a minute, I'm going to read that entire verse because it's wonderful. But before we get to that, I want to say that contact of the consciousness with the sense organs is always going to be partial, finite, and hence unsatisfactory. That's why the Buddha said, this material world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. These things are all actually one thing. The fact that the world, meaning the perceptions revealed by contact of consciousness with the senses and the sense objects, are not self. By definition, the self is the witness. And the objects are that which is witnessed, that which is seen. The drishya, huh? that which is seen, is different from the self. It's the object, and the self is the subject. This is all like so fundamental and elementary that it becomes an unspoken assumption in our consciousness, in our language, in our philosophies, and so on. So let's look into this business one more time of the infinite. That which is infinite is bliss. There is no bliss in what is finite. The infinite alone is bliss. But the infinite itself should be sought to be understood. Revered sir, I wish to understand the infinite. Wherein one sees nothing else, hears nothing else, and understands nothing else, that is the infinite. Wherein one sees something else, hears something else, and understands something else, that is finite. That which is infinite is immortal. That which is finite is mortal. Revered sir, wherein does that rest? In its own majesty or not in majesty. In the world, what they call majesty is cows and horses, elephants and gold, slaves and wives, lands and houses. I do not say this, he said, as in that case one thing would rest upon another. What I do say is this, what follows. That itself is below, that above, that behind, that before, that to the right, that to the left. That itself is all this. Next follows the teaching through the notion of I. I itself is below, I above, I behind, I before, I to the right, I to the left. The I is all this. 
So we went over this in the last video, but I just wanted to say it again, read it again, because it's so important. Anything that is perceived has to be less than or different from the self. I mean, this is axiomatic, isn't it? It's fundamental, it's basic. Therefore, that state in which one does not see anything else, hear anything else, etc., that is the real self. That is the real state. That is infinite. That's what all the Upanishads say. Therefore, the state of sushupti, in which one sees nothing, hears nothing, etc., is the real state of the self. This cannot be overemphasized. That's why in samadhi, in deep meditation, there are no impressions. One is in an emptiness, nothingness. Nirvana, Nibbana, the cessation of everything. In one sense, you could say this is death. Not only the death of the small individual self, but also the death of the world. Everything is finished because the senses are inactive. There are no impressions. There is no need for a body, for senses, for intelligence, for the mind, for impressions, for memory, for reason. None of that matters. What to speak of desire. <laughs> desire is completely absent in that state. Because desire is what makes us suffer. Try to understand. Everything in the mortal world that we consider important and valuable is actually a cause of suffering. So if we want to end our suffering, we have to end this mortal life and pass to the divine life, which, as was stated in the previous verse, one becomes the king of heaven. Now, what is the bliss experienced in this state? Let's see the next verse. Text 33. He who is perfect of body and prosperous among men, the ruler of others and most lavishly supplied with all human enjoyments, represents the greatest joy among men. This human joy multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy for the manes who have won that world of theirs. The joy of these manes who have won that world multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy in the world of the celestial minstrels, Gandharvas. This joy in the world of the celestial minstrels multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy for the gods by action, those who attained their godhead by their actions. This joy of the gods by action multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy for the gods by birth, as well as of one who is versed in the Vedas, sinless and free from desire. This joy of the gods by birth multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy in the world of Prajapati, Viraj, as well as of one who is versed in the Vedas, sinless and free from desire. This joy in the world of Prajapati multiplied a hundred times makes one unit of joy in the world of Brahman, Hiranyagarbha, as well as of one who is versed in the Vedas, sinless and free from desire. This indeed is the supreme bliss. This is the state of Brahman, O Emperor, said Yajnavalkya. I give you a thousand cows, sir. Please instruct me further about liberation itself. At this, Yajnavalkya was afraid that the intelligent emperor was constraining him to finish with all his conclusions. So let's do the math. One unit of the bliss of a perfect king, we'll call that 10 to the zero or one times the standard unit of human bliss, 
multiplied by 100 is the level of bliss for the mains, the ancestors. That's 10 squared, 100 times the bliss of a standard human. That multiplied by 100 gives the level of bliss for the Gandharvas, 10 to the fourth, or 10,000 times the human bliss. That multiplied by 100 gives the level of bliss for the gods by action, 10 to the sixth, or 1 million times the bliss of a perfect human being. That multiplied by 100 gives the level of bliss of the gods by birth, or 10 to the eighth, a hundred million times human bliss. That multiplied by a hundred gives the level of bliss for prajapati, viraj. We talked about viraj back in the Mandukya Upanishad series. 10 to the 10th or 10 billion times the human bliss. And that multiplied by a hundred gives the level of bliss of Brahman, Hiranyagarbha, 10 to the 12th, or 1 trillion times the bliss of a perfect human being. So, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I guess that's enough, huh? 1 trillion times the bliss? Definitely. So let's go on and read uh, Shankaracharya's purport on this verse. It has been said that all beings from Hiranyagarbha down to men live on particles or fractions of the supreme bliss. In order to convey an idea of this bliss as a whole through its parts, as of a rock of salt through its grains, the present paragraph is introduced. He who is perfect of body, having no physical defects, and prosperous, provided with luxuries among men, also the ruler of others, the independent lord of people of the same class, not a mere provincial ruler, and most lavishly supplied with all human enjoyments. The adjective human excludes the materials of heavenly enjoyment. He is the foremost among those who possess all these human luxuries. He represents, or literally is, the greatest joy among men. The identity of joy and its possessor in this sentence, joy meaning enjoyer, indicates that this joy is non different from the self. For it has been said in the passage, when there is something else, as it were, in 4.3.31, that the lower degrees of bliss have only emanated from the supreme bliss in the dual form of subject and object. Hence, it is but proper to bring out this identity in the phrase greatest joy. Kings like Yudhishthira are examples in point. The Shruti teaches us about this supreme bliss in which differences cease by making a start with human joy, which we all know, and multiplying it a hundred times in successive steps. Now, where this joy increasing a hundred times at each step reaches its limit, and where mathematical differences cease, there being nothing else but the self to see, hear, or think, that is the supreme bliss. And in order to describe this, the text proceeds. This has been called the supreme bliss, of which the joys of the world of Hiranyagarbha, etc., are but particles, like drops of an ocean. That in which the other joys, increasing step by step in multiples of a hundred, merge, and which is experienced by one versed in the Vedas, is indeed the supreme bliss called samprasada, that experienced in profound sleep. For in it one sees nothing else, hears nothing else, and so on. Hence it is infinite, and for that reason immortal, the other joys are the opposite of that. The Vedic erudition and sinlessness mentioned above are common to the other joys too. It is the difference made by the absence of desire that leads to the increase of joy a hundred times. 
Here it is suggested by implication that Vedic erudition, sinlessness, and the absence of the desire are the means of attaining the particular types of joy, as rites such as the Agnihotra are means to the attainment of Godhead by the gods. Of these, the two factors, Vedic erudition and sinlessness, are common to the lower planes too. Hence, they are not regarded as means to the attainment of the succeeding kinds of joy. For this, the absence of desire is understood to be the means, since it admits of degrees of renunciation. This supreme bliss is known to be the experience of the Vedic scholar who is free from desire. Veda Vyasa also says, The sense pleasures of this world and the great joys of heaven are not worth one-sixteenth part of the bliss that comes from the cessation of desire. Mahabharata. Well, <laughs> do we want that bliss? Yes, we do. Do we need that bliss? Absolutely. This is why deep sleep and dreams are indispensable, especially deep sleep. We can dream all we want, and that will not give us the infinite bliss that we seek. Because dreams are not immortal. They have a beginning and an end. Now you might say, well, deep sleep also has a beginning and end, because when we go to sleep at night, after we finish dreaming, we have deep sleep, and then we come out of it again into dreaming and waking consciousness. But when we are in Sushupti, we don't know anything else. There is no beginning. There is no end. It is timeless. This is why Nibbana in the Buddha Suttas is called timeless, Akalika. Huh? And it can be seen by all men. It can be enjoyed by everyone, and indeed it is. The problem is, just like Turiya, we are in it, but we don't recognize it. We experience it, but we don't see its value. We benefit from it, but we don't realize how essential it is to our well-being and everything else that we desire. In fact, desiring is the problem. Desire, along with ignorance and the delusion of thinking we can enjoy in this world, are the three types of ignorance that bring us into samsara and keep us in samsara as long as we don't give them up. So the important thing here, actually the point of this whole series is that one should be very careful to try to observe this sushupti. Try to wake up during dreams and observe one's transition in and out of the timeless state of the infinite. We have this desire, this, as we called it last time, nostalgia for the infinite. Without the infinite, we can't say that we are truly alive because this is the experience that makes us the self. That if we realize it and if we begin to cultivate it through deep meditation and especially through giving up desire, this allows us to approach the supreme destination now, I know I'm going to lose a lot of people when I say this. <laughs> but that's because we are conditioned with the idea that bliss means enjoying the objects of the world. But actually, that's not bliss. That's suffering. All the different kinds of bliss experienced all the way up to Brahma huh? is simply temporary. And when we lose that bliss, at most, at the end of the material creation, when everything merges back into Brahman, 
we then suffer because we desire it again. So instead of suffering, we should just enter that state of the Supreme Brahman now by realizing Turiya. And then all desires are satisfied. That means there is no suffering whatsoever. And that bliss is a trillion times the most that we can experience in this human life. Is that enough to get you motivated to do the sadhana, to realize this state? I hope so. Because in the next series, we're going to pick up again with Mandukya Upanishad, and we're going to discuss Turiya in detail. And this is going to be uh, based on what we've just gone through. This is going to be the crowning glory of the four states of consciousness. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.